Did you ever try to hold out that lasts forevermore like they do? <laughs> you run out of breath. Run out of breath for sure. All right. It's a blessing. That's a great song. Okay, let's go over to Exodus chapter 3 here this morning, please. Now I want to bring you another message on the Messiah revealed in Moses. And we're going to look at Moses in relationship to the burning bush. So what I'd like to do this morning is read the first nine verses of Exodus chapter number 3. I'll wait till you all turn back there. Okay. First nine verses is what we'll read. All right, as we look and see. All right, verse number one. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horbrid, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet. For a place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land, that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the uh, Perizzite and the Hivites and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now there's the beginning of this. Moses and the burning bush. Now if you've ever seen anything on fire, especially if it was brush, hay, wood, you realize that it quickly goes up, then it's gone. But here we have a situation where there's a bush that's burning, but wasn't consumed. Now, you know, for me, I've never seen that. Have you? <laughs> no. Moses, as far as I know, is the only person in the world that's ever seen that. Okay? So, in other words, most fires are whoosh, and they're gone, as you see. I can tell you a lot of sea stories about, about fires, all right, and the things that happen because of them. But when we look at Moses here and what he experienced, we have to remember, what was he doing? What was his job? He was shepherding sheep. How long he had been doing this? Anybody remember? 40 years. He was 40 years old when he left Egypt. 40 years with his father-in-law. Okay. You know, the priest of Midian married one of the girls his daughters, and he became a shepherd, all right, taking care of his father's lost sheep. So he's 40 years divorced from Egypt and from the people of Israel, and he's back here living a secure life. I mean, why did he leave Egypt? Because he killed someone, hit his body, but it was seen, and he thought, hey, they're going to come after me, and the scripture declares that. Pharaoh sought to kill Moses, so what did he do? He escaped, and he met these seven ladies that were taking care of the sheep, and he helped them water the sheep, and then the girls went back home to their father and said, oh, we got help from this gentleman. Well, where is he? Why didn't you bring him along for dinner? And so what they did, they went back and got him and brought him. And the scripture says that he stayed with them. He married Zephora, the one daughter, okay, and he's there for 40 years doing what? shepherding sheep 
Okay, shepherding thing. But then Moses sees a bush burning but not being consumed. Now think of the shock of that. What would you think of that? Now, now listen. Some say, oh, it's a miracle. He would have known it's a miracle. How did he know? He wasn't attached to Israel. He wasn't attached to anybody in, that, that had a, a relationship with God, except for the Midian priest. Okay? So it must have just been an, an amazing sight to him, okay, as you look at this. So what was happening here? That's what we want to look at. What was actually happening? Well, the bush, by matter of fact, was a thorn bush. Okay? A thorn bush. The Hebrew word is senthe. It means a pricker bush. Or in other words, a bramble with prickers in it. Okay? Now watch this. Keep your hand here and come back to Acts with me in chapter number 7. All right. Acts chapter number 7. All right. Acts chapter 7. Be there in a second. Acts 7. And watch what we have here when we read verses 30 and then 35. Acts chapter 7, verse number 30. Here it says in verse 30, After 40 years had passed, this is where I get the number from, of 40, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. Y'all read that? Okay. Then I come down to verse number 37, I believe, is what we want. No, 35. And it says here in 35, This Moses whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one whom God sent to both, be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in a what? Thorn bush. Okay is what the word is there when you, you read back in, in the book of Exodus. So to me, that's interesting. So what message does this communicate to us as the reader of Scripture? What message can we get out of this? Okay. Well, I think there's a number of them. Okay. Because this small detail communicates a deep and beautiful message. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Keep your hand in, in Exodus, okay, if you can do that. And come back to Genesis chapter number 3. First place we notice <laughs> thorns is in Genesis chapter 3. And let's notice verses 17 uh, through 19. Now remember, this is after the fall, right? God has just spoken to the serpent. Now to Adam he's going to speak in verse 17. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Did, did, did Adam eat the, of the tree because of Satan or the serpent? Because of whom? Because of his wife. And the wife was the one who was deceived, according to Paul in 1 Timothy, right? Okay. Now, watch this. This is God speaking to Adam because he listened to his wife in this situation. <laughs> he disobeyed the command of God. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. What's going to grow thorns and thistles for him? The ground is growing, <laughs> now watch, thorns and thistles for whom? For particularly for Adam. They're going to come up because he has to what? The ground is cursed because of him, it says there in verse 17. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. But th both thorns and thistles... It shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, and you, for you are dust, and to dust you shall what? You shall return. So what do we picture then about thorns and bristles, <laughs> thistles rather, the first time they're mentioned? Hard work, something negative here. It's something Adam's going to have to do. He's going to have to farm the land, if we say that, okay? And what's it going to produce beside the, the good stuff? Thorns and thistles along with it. 
weeds and all that sort of thing. But he's going to have to work by the sweat of his brow to eat the bread. So he's going to have wheat or whatever, okay, that, that we see that, okay? So therefore, it's not surprising that God speaks out of a thorn bush to Moses to commission him to redeem Israel out of Egypt. Because where was Israel? They were in the furnace of fire, as we saw here a couple weeks ago, if you remember that. Three times in Scripture, it declares that Egypt was a furnace of fire in relationship to Israel, a place of suffering which God talks about there in verses 1 through 9 with Moses of Exodus, right? And so the thorn becomes a picture then of suffering, all right? Suffering. It's a sad situation. So we have to ask, why did he appear in the midst of a bush of thorns rather than in a large tree, okay, or a column of smoke, question mark. Now, I got, a, I got an opinion on that from the Mishrash. Does anybody know what that is, Mishrash, M-I-D-R-A-S-H? Well, I'm going to read it to you here, okay, what the Mishrash is, All right? <clears throat> It is a Jewish biblical exegesis using rabbinical mode of interpretation prominent in the Talmud. What's the Talmud? We talked about this last couple of weeks. Okay, it's a commentary in the first five books. Okay, the Talmud. Now, let me share with you, this is off of uh, Wikipedia, if you ever want to look at it. Okay, you, you can do that. Uh, Midrash and rabbinical readings in quotes, discern value in texts, words, and letters as potential relatory spaces, writes the Hebrew scholar Wilda Gaffney. They, they reimagine dominant narrative readings while crafting new ones to stand alongside, not replacing, okay, former readings. Midrash also asks questions of the text. When you study, do you ask questions of the text? If you don't, you're not studying. Why, wherefores, who, and all that sort of thing? Okay, when, when you do that. So, it provides answers. Sometimes it leaves the reader to answer the question themselves. Now, Vanessa Lovelace, who is a, a doctor of Hebrew, okay, the language, defines Midrash as a Jewish mode of interpretation that not only engages the words of the text, behind the text, beyond the text, but also focuses on each letter and the words left unsaid by each line. So in other words, she says it's contextual here, and we're looking in between the lines of things that aren't said, which we do quite often. All Bible people do that, all right? And, and to see that. So continues on here. The Holy One, that'd be God, blessed be he, said, I have stated in the Torah, I will be with him, that's Israel, in trouble. And then David picks it up in Psalm 91, 15. Inasmuch as they were enslaved, I appeared in a bush of thorns, which is a place of trouble. Where were they? In Egypt, in a place of trouble. God appeared, therefore, to Moses in a place of trouble. Therefore, out of the midst of a bush, which is full of thorns, I appeared unto him. Now, I want to ask you a question. On Facebook yesterday, I found a new person from Rochester, New York. That's a preterist. And he and his wife put together a book. And the name of the book, okay, is Christ Already Appeared. So why are you still looking for him? And I thought that was a good, good quote. And that book was sold at our Alpha and Omega bookstore, which really surprised me because they're pretty standard, okay? But at any rate, the book sold out in its first printing in the first month that it came out. So I'm hoping I can get in touch with him, okay, and, and get some fellowship and perhaps have him come out and, and speak to us about it, because it, to me, it's a wonderment. 
But here's the deal, a testimony he gave in, in, in Facebook. When we look at life, Dan was talking about, that was a great message, by the way, this morning. We look at our ambitions and all that. What do most of our ambitions revolve around? Susan and I have been over the last month, because of the problem we have with the flood, okay, at home, have been getting rid of stuff. Stuff that we have collected over the years. Stuff of, as we perceive ourselves in our 70s and maybe 80s and hopefully, you know, who knows how long we're going to be. But where's that stuff all going to go when we're gone? It's going to go to Dan's house. <laughs> Dan has a huge basement. Okay. But where's it going to go when Dan's gone? Stuff is nothing but stuff. I mean, we still have the school records from Joel and Joshua. And a small box, Susan says. Okay? Because we homeschooled them. And, and what do you do with all that kind of stuff? It's just stuff. What I'm trying to say is this. When, and when Dan talked about you know, a ambition and the stuff that we have in home and why we work and the things we gather into our, our homes. But what about our lives? Because I look back at the life of Moses, a man who was saved by three ladies. All right? When you read the Talmud, it gives you the idea they built a basket, mom and sister, and they put a lid on the basket. And the New American Standard makes that clear. Because when the princess of Egypt saw it, they took the lid off to see what was inside of it. And what was it? Oh, it was a young child. Now, he could have been up to five years old. Remember the, 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 uh, the sister asked the princess, uh, listen, I know a lady would take him and nurse him till he can come to you. And they, it was common back then for a, a child to be nursed till they're four or five years old. But at any rate, then who took him? The, the prince, princess. She did what? She was a redeemer to him. Because how about all the other children that were too, you know, that, that they, they were put in the Nile to drown them. But yet he was redeemed by whom? Three women. Now, isn't that amazing? Okay? But then he ended up running for his life. His life was not easy. Okay? Not at all, as you look at it. Now, look at our Lord's life. He didn't drive a Lamborghini. Did he? In fact, when we read about him making his trek from Jerusalem to Galilee and Galilee back to Jerusalem, how far was that? We're talking 40, 50 miles. And you don't even read that they uh, rode on camels or donkeys. In fact, we don't know the Lord rode on a donkey until he came into Jerusalem in the last week of his life. Do you all remember that? And why did he do that, by the way? What was it? And what prophecy? Listen, when a king came on a colt into a city, it was in peace as a king. If he brought in a horse, it was to do battle. All right? So that's why he came in. But the point being this, our Lord didn't have the easiest life in the world. All right? Now, he was able to provide for the apostles, the people of Israel, that sort of thing. But at one time he said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. I have to use a rock. So life isn't, wasn't meant to be easy for us, especially as believers, because as Dan brought out, our joy and our peace is found where? In our heart. As much as we all want peace in the United States of America, and our problem isn't with other nations, it's with our what? It's with ourselves. That peace is never going to come. We must find that peace within where? Ourselves. So God comes, appears to Moses in a thorn bush, which equals trouble. Okay? Which equals trouble. And as you look at this, what it shows you is this. Coming back to chapter 3 and 7 and 8. That God himself 
Okay? God himself identifies with their suffering. 7 and 8. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have given heed to their cry, because they're taskmasters, for I am aware of their, what? Sufferings. How long had they been there? Well, we say 400 years. Our brother Bill Petrie did a study and showed us it's closer to about 250 to 300 years. Okay, but it's a long period of time. Many generations. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land, uh, from that land, to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the uh, Perizzite and uh, Hivite and the Jebusite. Now let me ask you a question. When they finally, with Joshua, crossed the Jordan, it was another generation of Jews, was it not? It wasn't that original generation. What kind of life did they have? They had a fight for everything and for every piece of land that they got. You read about Jericho. Remember Jericho? Joshua bought, you know, the song. <laughs> okay. And, and you look at that, and they went around it seven times, crashed. You don't read that again. They went and had a fight. And they had to farm the land. And it wasn't easy. And in fact, as you read it very carefully, you'll find that they never did get rid of all the people that lived prior to them. Okay? So there was constant battle, especially when you read the book of Judges. It's not till David shows up. And David, in, in his, uh, you know, being, being a general king with the army, finally brings peace to the place. And then under Solomon... There's what you and I would call peace. But that was an outward peace, not an inward peace. Because poor Solomon in his own heart was never satisfied. Was he? No, he wasn't. Okay? So it, it, it's that kind of situation. But when Israel heard about this, watch what happens in chapter 4. All right? Chapter 4 of Exodus. In verse, verses 30 and 31 is what I want. Uh, well, let's back up to 28. Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord uh, with which he had sent him and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and, the, and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he performed the signs in the sight of the people, which we'll talk about in the next message. So the people believed. And when they had heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their afflictions, they bowed low and did what? They bowed low and they worshipped. Now, stay here and come back all the way back to, um, where are we going here? Nehemiah and chapter number 8. All right. You got Ezra, Nehemiah. And Esther, right after Chronicles there. Okay? So Nehemiah chapter 8, and watch this. Now, does anybody here know the background of the book of Nehemiah? Es actually, you can say Ezra and Nehemiah. Very basic. Can anybody, does anybody know what it was? Okay, Ezra. Okay, during that time frame. Okay, Zerubbabel, they rebuilt the temple. And then with Nehemiah, they rebuilt the walls. All right, we Re rebuilt the walls. And uh, I want to say the walls were rebuilt in around chapter number six. Okay, yeah, the wall is finished in chapter number six. The temple's already there. Now, what happens is this. They had just come out of Babylon. Okay, they were captives in Babylon. Some of the folks up there got so comfortable they stayed. But they were, and they returned to the land. And it wasn't easy because when they came back to the land, there were people there that didn't want them. All right? That didn't want them. So watch this when I read verses 1 through 3 here in chapter 8 of Nehemiah. And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen, listen, 
with understanding. On the first day of the seventh month, he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women and those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now, that's a wonderful thing. But when did it happen? It happened on their return from captivity when the temple was already built. Now, this took years. It wasn't overnight. And the walls were rebuilt, right, as, as you look at this. Now, notice verse 6. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, <clears throat> the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and did what? Worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Good news had come back, come to them, just like it did back in Exodus chapter number 3 and 4. Good news. And you know what? <laughs> you go down to verse 9 and, and read on. It's really interesting because you would think, well, they must have confessed their sins. No. You know what happened? Ezra and the leaders near my told them, listen, go have a feast. They brought forth the Feast of Tabernacles for the first time since Joshua which was a long time ago, okay? But they had a feast. After the feast, then they repented, confessed their sins, and went on with life. But the point being this is what I'm trying to convey to you. Life isn't easy. But yet, what did these folks do? They worshiped God when they heard the word because it came, life then became spiritual, okay? It became spiritual. And I think we need to understand that totally so <laughs> God cared deeply for them they understood it and that should give us some comfort you say why because somebody cares for you we might not see that or perceive it all the time but someone cares for you and who would that be that'd be our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father they care for you. But there's another thought here. Come back with me to, uh, uh, where are we going? Deuteronomy chapter 18. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 18, please. And let's notice 18. Chapter 18 and verse number 18, please. It says, I will raise up a prophet from among their country, men like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. Okay? Now in verse 15 it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your countrymen, you shall listen to him. Of course, who are they speaking about? Jesus Christ. So I come back to... Matthew, please, and notice chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. God spoke out of a bush. What kind of bush? A, thir a thorn bush that was burning. What does fire represent anyway in Scripture? Purification and cleansing. Okay? So he speaks out of this thorn bush, which we connect with uh, Adam, back in Genesis, tough life. Israel, tough life. What kind of is, you know, is, Jews today have a tough life, don't they? I mean, they, they went back to their, uh, to their roots in 1948. We know that. The UN put them back together. But has it ever been peaceful? No, not at all. Okay, not at all. So notice this in chapter 27 and verse 29. Talk about thorns. Verse 29, please. Here it says, After and after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, who did this? This is the soldiers. They put on him a what? Crown of thorns. Adam's whole life was spent with thorns okay his whole life Moses lived that kind of life of suffering here Jesus Christ when he takes our sin 
as Redeemer and goes to the cross, wears a what? And I don't think that was by accident. These soldiers mocked him, saying this was his crown. Yeah, his crown of suffering, because that's what thorns represent. But to Christ, I believe it symbolized his connection to his people and to the rest of mankind, by the way. Through suffering that he overcame the sin and death problem that man has. Now there's one more thought I'd like to give you about this. And you think about this one for a while. The Jewish sages, what's a sage? It's a wise man, okay? Taught that when Moses heard the voice speak from the bush, that he heard the voice of his father. What would you do if you saw a bush that was burning that all of a sudden it talked to you? There, there, there'd be a little fear there, all right? But watch. I, I don't know anybody's ever heard the actual ver voice of God. The scripture doesn't declare that. G, uh, uh, Paul did, okay, as, as we see this. And, and look at it that way. But the idea is this. He sees, he sees and he hears. How would we react? I mean, it was strange. What if it was a strange voice that Moses heard? Who knows? You know, what, what his reaction would have been. But Moses now, with concern, <laughs> hearing a familiar voice, turns to find out what it's all about. God, you know, who knows? Does anybody know what language God spoke? We don't even know that, do we? Okay. But it's an act of listening to God's voice. It revealed with the voice of Moses' father that Moses awakens to the realization that he's somewhere special. Okay. Somewhere special. The sages, I believe, are suggesting that Moses heard God's voice in the deepest recess of his heart. Now, we don't know what Moses' relationship was with his actual biological father once the princess took him into the throne room of the Pharaoh. All right? We don't know that. But we do know that he went daily to see how the Israelites were doing at their work. Maybe that was his job. I don't know. So his mother and his father might have been there. But God's voice struck a chord, I believe, that had been implanted in him at birth. God's voice had an intimacy that only a father's or a mother's voice could have. A voice that could motivate Moses to change. Because that's what God's going to ask him to do, is change. We're going from sheep to people. What does Jesus tell us in the gospel accounts? Sheep to people. It's very important. Okay, as you see these things. I mean, the lessons begin back in the Old Testament. And they carry on through the New Testament as you look at these things. Okay? So, God is going to give Moses a responsibility to respond to what the Lord's message is going to be to Israel. But he needs somebody to take the responsibility and respond to that responsibility. Okay? Now remember this. He felt safe and secure for 40 years. All he was was a shepherd of sheep, right? In his current situation. But now, God's speaking with his father's voice. Can be that way. Okay? For something different. But he's still going to be a shepherd. Okay? So let's come back to Exodus chapter 3, please. All right? Exodus chapter 3. There are so many lessons for us in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 3. <laughs> let's notice, please, verse number 4 and 5. Verses number 4 and 5. When the Lord saw, in verse 4, that he turned aside to look, God called him. Now notice, when he turned aside to look, that's when God called him. If he'd have kept going, God wouldn't have called him. 
So when he turned aside to look, God called him, right? Is that what it says? God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Why would he say that to anybody but a family member? Here I am, he says. Then he said, do not come near. Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is what? It's holy ground. Now, this won't be the last time that Moses is in the presence of something that's flaming to communicate with God. For he goes back to Horbin, the mount of God with the Jews. Okay, what's going to happen? The whole mountain's going to be aflame and smoke. Okay, so this is, it's all interesting, it's interconnected. Okay, so here's what I believe happens here. Why does he have to remove his sandals? Okay, removing the sandals removes, how would you say this, barriers between God and Moses. Because where is he standing? Holy ground, God's ground, right? So the purpose of shoes or sandals is to create a barrier. There's only one person I ever met in my life that liked to go around without shoes on. That was Mrs. Haley. When I met her, the first time I met her was at a... Remember, she was my neighbor. And her brother and I played basketball and football together and basketball and baseball for years together. And I didn't even know she existed till I saw this crazy girl doing flips and somersaults and everything in a basketball game. So after the game, I went and she was a cheerleader at, this, at her school. I introduced myself. And she says, oh, I'm, I'm Susie Gray. I said, Gene's brother. Yeah. I said, well, listen, I'm going your way. How about if I walk you home? That's what we did. Snow on the ground, and she's walking with bare feet. Crazy, isn't it? So you don't see people do that all the time. But watch this. What do feet do? I mean feet. What, what do shoes do? They protect your feet from experiencing pain or discomfort. Now, why was God calling Moses out? To a ministry that would not be comfortable. Where there would be pain and discomfort. Okay? Shoes represent a barrier and symbolic disconnection to God. When you're on holy ground. Moses, remove your sandals. God's desire was for Moses to be completely connected with him on a spiritual level. For Moses to fully experience God's holy presence, he had to do what? Remove his shoes. Now the Hebrew word for sandals in chapter 3 and verse number 5 is na'alaim. It's actually three syllables. The root word is na'al. N-A, get that little mark. A-L, I never did pronounce, know how to pronounce Hebrew, okay? And it means literally lock, L-O-C-K. What's a lock do? It prevents you from going somewhere or getting out from somewhere, okay? Getting out from somewhere. So, the removal of the sandals means Moses had to unlock the things that lock up and confine us. Moses focused focuses on the things that are his shortcomings, which we'll see in a moment. Things he believes make him unfit candidate to become the redeemer of Israel. Notice, if you would, chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. And notice what it says here. <clears throat> Here's a time when you need your marker. But I know... We're in chapter 3, verse 19 of Exodus. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go, except they're under, under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty handed. They're going to get wealth from there. But notice, each verse, 19, 20, and 21 says what? I know, 
I will, I will. Who's that? That's God. He doesn't tell Moses that he'll do that. God says, I know, I will, I will. <coughs> okay, as, as you look at this. But how did Moses look at himself? Turn to chapter 4 again with me. Okay, chapter number 4. And watch verse 10 through 13, please. 10 through 13. Then Moses said to the Lord, this is after the Lord gave him his commission. Or was trying to give him a commission. Okay. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So what has happened here? God gives him a commission from the burning bush, and what's the first thing Moses does? You talk about the young man that God said, go, as Dan said, go, you lack one thing, go sell everything. And what did he say? He was sorrowful and went away. Moses did the same thing right here. That's right, Dick says, tried to do it. Okay, as you see it. So what was his problem? It was a communication problem, slow of tongue. I mean, where's he been for 40 years? Talking to the sheep. Verse 11, the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him to mute or deaf? Or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Whomever you will is Moses. But Moses said, God, not me. There's got to be somebody else. All right? Are you with me there? So we come down to 14. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. The anger of the Lord burned against him. And he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, moreover behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put words, the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Man, that's amazing as you read that. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. And we already read those verses in 29 through 31, where the... Moses and Aaron appeared, and Aaron told the people what God was going to do, and what did they do? They worshiped God, did they not? Okay, we all got that? So Moses struggles with his inner barriers and had physical limitations that he was unwilling to try to come overcome. He had a speech impediment. Now these type of barriers tend to separate us from whom? From God. Not only from God, but from our true selves. And from others. Thus the removal of the shoes is symbolic of the removal of physical, emotional, and spiritual limitations that keep us from a deeper connection with God, from our inner selves, and with His desire to work through us. Everybody has an excuse. Yeah, but. And even Moses, right? Now here's something interesting. Do you realize that each foot, I can't see your feet because you have shoes on, so I guess we're not in holy ground. But I'm going to say something to you. We are in holy ground. You walk daily in holy ground. Why is that? God is within you. What is the greatest gift God has given us? His very nature. We walk continually in holy ground. Okay? As you look at this. But each foot has more than 7,000 nerves, nerve endings, that connect to every organ and system in your body. I have a book at home that's 230 pages. It's this big. 
And you know what it's about? Foot massaging. 230 pages. Because every place on the bottom of your foot, there's a nerve attached somewhere. There was a time when I used to massage Susan's feet to help her because of her diabetes. Okay? As you, as you look at that. Thus, your feet are protected from pain by your what? Your shoes. But, picture spiritual disconnection and desensitivity to God and others because you and your spiritual life leave your shoes on in holy ground. Now, just think about it for a while. So, what does the thorn bush teach? Well, basically, folks, it teaches this, that God cares. God cares. If, if you go to your concordance and you look, look up the word thorn, I think there's only six or seven references, but you look up the word thorns, plural, there's many of them. And go through and see what it's all about. Okay? Now, here's another little thing before, you, before I close. <laughs> when you read Leviticus and Exodus, Exodus and Leviticus, about the clothing that the priests wore, I mean, it was grandeur, the high priest. Just beautiful. Hat, you know, and all that kind of stuff. No shoes. No sandals. And even in the New Testament, in our Lord's day, when the priests ministered in the temple, no shoes. It's a picture, see? So what happens when you share the good news with somebody? Now think, think about this. This is another thing about feet. Are you ready for this? Okay. Come back to Isaiah. I'm almost finished. Come back to Isaiah, please, in chapter 52. Isaiah 52. Here we go. Almost went by it. Isaiah 52. And see if you can get Romans chapter 10 in your hand at the same time. All right. I know you're talented folks here. <sighs> Let's see what happens. Chapter 10. Here we are, chapter 10. All right, let's read Isaiah 52 and verse number 7 says this. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, and who brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation. What is lovely? Here, verse 7. What's lovely? The feet are lovely. They're lovely. Okay? Now come over to Romans chapter 10. And let's notice verses 11 through 15. For the scripture says, Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Now, isn't that amazing? So what happens when you take the gospel out, for example? You're, spiritually speaking, you're barefoot. And your feet are what? Beautiful. Now, Susan, can you remember at Trinity Baptist Church when the bus director from Jack Hiles Church came and preached to us? And I can't remember the fellow's name. Jack Hiles is a pastor in Chicago, Illinois, of a super church. They ran 10,000 people. And if you were late one minute, you couldn't get in because they locked the doors. They were very stringent on that. But their bus director was a great guy. Okay, and I don't know how many hundreds of buses they had to go out and bring pe people in. But he preached at Trinity when I was down there in Bible school. And he came to the edge of the, of the stage. They had a stage set about this high because it was a huge place. And uh, he sat down and he unlaced his shoes, took his shoes off, took his socks off. And he says, look at that beauty you know we say beauty in the eye of what so what does God behold 
how beautiful are the feet of those. See? I mean, it's a wonderment. As, as you read Scripture and try to get lessons out of it, okay? As you see, because the, the, the bare feet on holy ground are a picture of your connection with God. That's what it's all about. The Lord can break through your limitations, by the way. You can have a deeper level of connection and sensitivity to the things of the Spirit. How? You have to believe it. You have to believe what's written in the Word. That's how it happens. Belief. How does a person get saved? Belief. We just read that. Belief. Believe. In other words, folks... Remove your spiritual shoes, okay, so you can be in contact with God. Remove it. Standing on holy ground. The holy ground is you, it is in you. Keep that in mind. Be encouraged by that. Don't be discouraged. Oh, I can't. I couldn't. I won't. That's what we say a lot of times. But God, God is good. He really is. And we have a great time with him. So let's do this. Let's end by praising God in song.